the community and currently working as a statistician in Statistics Indonesia. I am very delighted and happy to join you all in the collaborating webinar of SBEC Community and Young Statistician of International Statistical Institute entitled COVID-19 from a Statistical Point of View. I hope everyone, wherever you are, is safe and staying well in this pandemic situation. As we, as we all knew, people, a lot, people around the world are engaged in this crisis in a various different situation. Therefore, SB Community is organizing a fundraising project to help those who are struggling with the COVID-19 in Indonesia. Please visit s.bps.go.id slash donasi underscore SB to donate. Before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone to remain silent while the speakers are speaking. So please ensure to mute the microphone on your gadgets. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there are several sessions for today's agenda as follows. First, opening speech by Olivia van Dijk Timbal and Mara Sherlin of International Statistical Institute. Second, keynote speech by Suharyanto, the chief, the chief statistician of Statistics Indonesia. Third, presentation from our speakers, Satya Pramana of Statistics Indonesia and Marlene Weiner of Statistics Austria. And the last, closing remark by the SBA community representative. Before we start it, I'd like to once again remind you to ensure to mute the microphone on your gadgets. Fellow participants, for our first agenda, I'd like to invite Olivia van Dijk Timbal, the Association Officer of International Statistical Institute for the opening speech. Please, Olivia, the time is yours. Good day, everyone. Um, I'm honored to join you today for another um, event filled with knowledge. I am currently the Recruitment and Operations Officer of the International Statistical Institute, and I am here today on behalf of the ISI. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the presence of the presence of Dr. Suhari Yanto, the Chief Statistician of Indonesia. Did I say it right? Um, our director, our president, and the whole ISI community want to extend their gratitude to your valuable contribution for today's event. Let me read to you the message of Professor John Baylor, the ISI president. One month ago, I was visiting the statistical colleagues from around the world, the, the vibrant city that never sleeps, New York City. Today, the streets of this city are empty. And like the most of you, I'm working from home with daily video conferences to interact on projects. ISI continues to work hard with activities related to planning WSC 2021 determining WSE 2023 location options, investigating enhancements to our web presence, and supporting activities of our community during these uncertain and evolving times. I thank our permanent office staff for their hard work supporting us from their homes. Last month, we had an ISI council call where we had updates about the International Year of, of Women in Statistics and Data Science. Happy 200th birthday, Florence Nightingale, from ISI councillor Jessica Utz. And about the working group on data science from IASC president and council member, Georgian Stimansi. I am very grateful to these leaders and members of these work groups for their efforts on behalf of ISI. In addition to these reports, the Council discussed ideas for recruiting new members, both regular and elected, and for recruiting sponsors. One test that ISI, and in fact, 
all professional societies need to address is why join a professional society when most of it, not all of the benefits of a society are available online. Bob Rodriguez, ISI elected, um, ISI elected member and former ASA of a society are available online. Bob Rodriguez, um, elected mem ISI elected member and former ASA pres um, president made the distinction between values and benefits. The tangible benefits of journal access are not as important now as during the days when you only receive publications by post. The values of membership continue, connection, community, and impact. ISI has given me much. It has made the world, particularly the, the statistical world, feel more connected. Interacting with statisticians from around the world and who work in areas and associations that differ from mine has expanded my thinking about our discipline. I have connections to colleagues and communities around the world and the world that I would not have known otherwise. Ironically, this includes colleagues in my own country. Our voices together will have more impact than our separate voices. ISI can be a voice to promote our discipline to the next generation of statisticians and can be an advocate for the legitimate practice of statistics around the world. I am proud member, I am a proud member of my National Statistical Society and I am delighted to engage as a world citizen in the ISI. I am encouraged by individuals and organizations around the world who are supporting their colleagues with their generous sharing of resources. Publishers are making available research work related to COVID-19 and newspapers are removing coverage from behind firewalls to provide up-to-date stories about the, the, about the pandemic. As part of my continuing professional education, I recently participated in a four-hour, two-part YouTube webinar related to ggplot2 and extensions that Thomas Lynn Pedersen taught. And I am participating in two courses, um, in two courses or courses related to programming. I, re I encourage all of you to use these days of social distancing to find opportunities to grow professionally, professionally and personally. Let me close by expressing gratitude to those healthcare workers and public health leaders who are working to lessen the suffering of those impacted by this pandemic. And I weep for those workers who have lost jobs or been furloughed during these uncertain days. I hope that these workers, you and your family will stay healthy. I look to the near future future when we will be able to shake hands and warmly welcome each other again. Again, on behalf of the ISI, welcome to this webinar. Thank you, Olivia. Now, I'll hand it over to Mara Sherlin, the president of Young Statistician of the International Statistical Institute to deliver her opening speech. Please, Mara, the time is yours. Hi, good day. I'm very grateful to everyone who um, gave their precious time to attend to this webinar. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Chief Statistician of Indonesia. And to our speakers, thank you so much. You are the main highlight of this event. Thank you for your dedication to help the growth of young statisticians without asking for anything in return. Your works really inspire us to do better and motivate the young statisticians to follow these good deeds in the future. 
I also like to take this opportunity to thank the University of the Philippines and my own alma mater, the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Thank you for hosting this Zoom webinar and to Mr. John Eric Dow, who's helping us with all the technicalities. I would also like to thank the ASBE community who put great effort into this event. If I'm not mistaken, they will still hold future events like this. I really do appreciate their good ethics and the work and how they handle responsibilities. Great job. On behalf of the Young Statisticians community, I thank all of you. Just a brief background about this event. Before this COVID-19 pandemic, the Young Statisticians Committee of ISI is conducting an annual regional workshop since 2017. So in Morocco, Taiwan, and then last year in Malaysia. But this year, since we know that fiscal meetings are not doable, so we decided to shift to virtual workshop. I wish we can finally see each other face-to-face, -face, especially on the 63rd World Statistics Congress. And hopefully we can um, host annual workshop there at the Hague, Netherlands. So as you can see, young stat is still young. And that's why our theme is um, COVID-19 from a statistical point of view. So I am thankful that SB community is on the same page with us and having the same mission. With that, we decided to have some collaboration and bring this webinar to you. So without further much ado, let me welcome you all and let's start this webinar. Thank you, Mara, for sharing it with us. For our next session, I'd like to invite our keynote speakers, Suharyanto, the Chief Statistician of Statistics Indonesia, to address the keynote speech. To Suharyanto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Media. Hello. Hello, everyone. I hope all of you are staying safe and healthy. It is really a pleasure for me to be here to join with all of you in this webinar. As we know, the outbreak of pandemic COVID-19 all over the world has disturbed the social and economic conditions, changing people's behavior, and also affected religious practices in many countries. In this uncertainty condition, it is very difficult to estimate how huge the impact of the pandemic to social economic life. Let's take an example of its impact on economic growth. The official figure released by National Statistics Office shocked the market because no one expects such a bad figure. For example, in China, in the first quarter 2019, the economic growth in China is 6.4%, but in quarter one, 2020, the economic growth in China experienced contraction under 6.8%. Another example is in the United States of America. I was in New York on 6 March in order to attend the United Nations Statistics Commission. At the time, the situation looked normal. A little bit panic, but it's okay. And suddenly, the economic growth in the United States dropped from 2.7% to 0.3%. Indonesia is no exception. In quarter one, 2019, economic growth in Indonesia is 5.07%, but this year dropped to 2.97%. My point is that the impact of pandemic on the economic and social impact is very, very huge. We know that many policies have to be implemented by many countries in order to combat the pandemic. But it is not easy. On one side, the government has to give priority to the heart of the people by implementing many policies, such as a lockdown, in order to delay the spread of the virus. But on the other side, the government has to think how to allow the economy to still function. Suppressing the epidemic, but allowing the economy to still function is very difficult and require key decisions. In order to make decisions, accurate statistics is a must. The role of statistics to handle COVID-19 is very important and cannot be underestimated. Because statistics provide essential data 
to be used in various aspects. If there is no statistic, there is no information, and there is no intervention. There is no story to be told without statistic. In this opportunity, I will show you several slides, several statistics, which I present in the front of the ministry and also parliament meeting to see the impact of COVID-19 in order to give early warning to the policymaker to understand how huge the impact of the COVID-19 to the social and economic condition in Indonesia. The data I presented here are collected using uh, different sources during the pandemic. For example, we use phone interview, we use email and website, we use administrative data, and we also use the big data. But for the big data, I will leave it to Satya Pramana. We will give uh, another talk uh, later. So let's see uh, the first uh, indicator. How much COVID-19 changed the way we live? In order to understand the effect of the pandemic to the income and expenditure, to understand the effect on the pandemic in order to change the expenditure pattern and also to understand whether people practice healthcare during the pandemic. PBS Statistics Indonesia has conducted a special survey in April 2020. We invite people to join to our webline survey and after cleaning the data, the number of the respondent is around 87,000 people. What we can see from this survey, most of the people understand and implement the policy of physical distancing policy, and most of them also stay at home. Most of the society in Indonesia wearing masks during the pandemic, indicating that they understand of the threat, they avoid shaking hands, they avoid long queues, they are using hand sanitizer, they wash and the using public transportation increase and also keep distance for at least two meters. In general, the result is quite convincing and quite promising, meaning that the people of Indonesia really understand the, the threat and try to avoid it by implementing the behavior. But if we go to the detail, we can understand then that the woman is more disciplined than the men. And one the only problem we have, it's very rare for Indonesian society to use clothes. I don't know what's the reason, but uh, not many people using clothes during the food. Another information we get from this uh, survey, we can see that 54% of the people suggested that uh, their income is decreased. We can see it in the next slide. 54% pe income people is decreased, and most of them now uh, stay at home, washing hands, and they are very rare to go outside. As a result, the expenditure uh, behavior is also changing. We can see there that most of the people say that the expenditure for the food stock, for the medical care, and also for telephone, internet bill, increase. We understand because we have to work from home, so the use of internet increase our jump quite uh, significantly. On the other hand, the expenditure for the transportation decrease, and then also for the fuel decrease. As a statistician, we have to pay attention on this changing behavior because this changing behavior will affect the inflation rate and at the end will affect to the consumption of household, which is a very important component in, in Indonesia, economic growth. So using uh, the result of the survey, the government uh, maybe need to do socialize in different parts of the country, uh, even though the, in general, People already implement hard care, but it's very rare people to use in gloves. And then uh, we have to think that uh, people have to 
uh, make some policies in order to help people to make their income uh, go back uh, just before the COVID-19 spread. The impact of, uh, of COVID-19 uh, is also due to the tourism and uh, its support activities. You can see in the next slide. Uh, for your information, the Indonesian government uh, officially released that the first case of COVID-19 in Indonesia in early March. But we can see from this picture, even though officially the first case is released in the early March, the impact already started at the beginning of February. And we are talking about the tourism. We can see that the the, the number of the foreign visitors in Indonesia dropped very quickly. If we compare it with the figure last year, it dropped 64%. Uh, 4%. And we also can identify by a nation which, can, which tourists uh, decrease. For example, from China, it decreased 97%. From Hong Kong, it decreased by 96%. From Kuwait, from United Emirates Arab and from across the world because a lot of country uh, implement a lockdown and they also do cancellation for their transportation. Considering this figure, we can understand or we can estimate that the supporting activities for the tourism in Indonesia will collapse. We can see that the room occupancy rate is declining very quickly economic creative also uh, decrease and then the threat of the let off and it affect the transportation trade sector etc we can see how much the impact of COVID-19 to the transportation which is the main support of the tourism in the next slide starting in February the trend of railway passenger dropped 34 percent the trend of the airline passenger for domestic dropped 45%. But if we see the international airline passenger dropped 63%. So from this figure, I have to see it's quite scary. And the impacts already uh, represented in the economic growth, which is far beyond uh, our expectation. However, the government also uh, uh, concerned with the logistic. So even though the number of the passenger decreased, but uh, the government still uh, tried to make the logistic work. So the number of logistic in February, March, and also April still uh, grow uh, quite quickly because this is very important, especially in Indonesia, uh, Currently, we are celebrating uh, Ramadan, Ramadan, and by the end of this uh, month, we will celebrate Idul Fitri, which is a, a big moment for the Muslim society in Indonesia. Another impact of the COVID-19 is to the inflation rate, which is very, very unusual. Uh, it's rate this month. Usually, during Ramadan, the demand of the people will increase and the government have to try to supply the stock and usually the inflation rate will increase quite uh, quite significantly but it's not happened this year we can see that the inflation rate decrease and we if we explore this uh, this pattern uh, further detail we can see that actually the supply of food is okay because the government already prepared it, uh, started two months ago. But from the demand side, we can see it's weakened, showing that the purchasing power parity from the society is also weakened, which is reflected in the decrease of core inflation. So during uh, using this uh, inflation rate, the government uh, use uh, create a lot of policies and all of the budget 
uh, the government will be used in order to to, to achieve three objectives. The first one is for the healthcare. The second one is the increase of the social protection. And the third one, we have to help the micro business because they are especially as uh, got the, the worst impact of the COVID. Lastly, uh, using the impact of COVID-19 to the labor, and this is, is the official figure from the Ministry of uh, labor but PBS statistic indonesia also use uh, big data setiap permana will uh, will be straight a letter we can see that the impact of covid 19 to labor is huge until the end of the march the number of impacted workers are uh, more than two millions and if we split it again we can see the informal sector and formal sector of course formal sector is uh, larger in this picture because it's very very difficult to capture the information from informal sector but for sure that the informal worker with the wage worker or self-employment are among the group which is most at risk of losing their job and income so considering what happened uh, based on all of this data and also data from other sources the government of Indonesia create many policies in the hope that the COVID-19 can end in Indonesia by uh, July 2020. And then we have to create so many policies in order to recover the economy from the debt. So once again, in the conclusion, uh, everyone, that the role of statistics to handle COVID-19 is very important and cannot be understood estimated because statistics provide essential data to be used in various aspects. Once again, if there is no statistic, we don't have information and it will be difficult to do intervention. And there is no story to be told without statistics. So please everyone do some deep analysis using available resources and let's try to inform our finding to the society. Using this one, we can help and we can contribute how to handle COVID-19 using accurate data. I end my uh, speech here and I hope uh, everyone will have a fruitful discussion. Uh, once again, thank you very much for inviting us to join with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Suharyanto, for the insights. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to say we are honored and thankful that you are willing to spare the time between your packed schedules to being here with us. You are pleased if you want to leave and if you want to leave the webinar to continue with your following schedules. Once again, thank you, sir. Our next sessions will be moderated by our moderator, Dia Ikawati, the head of Demographic Statistics Evaluation and Reporting Section of Statistics Indonesia. Dia Ikawati. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Mega. Good afternoon, Mr. Soharyanto, the Chief Statistician of Statistics Indonesia. And good afternoon, Olivia van Dijk Timbal, the representative of the International Statistical Institute, and also Mara Sherlin, the president of Young Statistics Statistical of the International Statistical Institute. Thank you very much for managing your valuable time, especially in this weekend to join today's webinar, and we are very grateful for that. Hello everyone, my name is Dia. I'm from BPS Statistics Indonesia, and I will be moderating today's webinar entitled COVID-19 from a statistical point of view. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for joining today's webinar. Hopefully you are staying healthy wherever you are and also happy fasting for the Muslim participants. I look at the database of the participants, around 524 people are joining today's webinar and I applaud YIS, ISI and also SB for this success. 
the global COVID-19 crisis is affecting operation across the entire global statistical system. This situation presents the increased demand for statistics to manage pandemic and also its impact. Because understanding and controlling the spread of COVID-19 is critically dependent on the availability of timely, high-quality data. This is addressing the increased need for data openness and also accessibility in order to help government to plan, to protect lives, and also to reduce the impact on the economy. In both the government and in the public response to COVID-19, data or statistics is more important than ever. There will be no story to be told without statistics, like Mr. Soharyanto said before. And statistics will help to fight this COVID-19, for surely. However, the currently available data are largely observational, or maybe only uh, focused on the very specific group of population, much of it derived from the testing. On the other hand, the NSO also faced some challenges in the data collection and also in the research activity in terms of methodology and also the accuracy and the level of detail available of the data. Even some statistics activities will need to be postponed or delayed or maybe even to be suspended. Then come big questions. What about data that we need to inform decision maker but haven't got yet, or when, or we can call it the known unknown. How well is official statistics equipped for giving support to experts from other fields? How big is the challenge of COVID-19 for the official statistics? Will there be new normal for official statistics after this pandemic? And many more other questions. And those are what we are going to discuss today. So first, we are going to have presentation and later on followed by discussion. So you are welcome to type all of your questions in the QA menu at any time during presentation and I will read them out during the discussion session. Type your name, affiliation, and then the presenter that you are referring to and then followed by your question. Please make it short and to the point. So everyone, in this webinar, we are delighted to have two amazing presenters. Both of them are statisticians, but come from different countries and also different expertise. Good afternoon, Satya Pramana and also Merlin Weiner. Thank you very much for managing your time to share with us today. Satya Pramana, from BPS Statistics Indonesia is known as the expert of big data in Indonesia. He is head of Subdirectorate Statistical Modeling Development in the Statistics Indonesia and also associate professor in the Polytechnic Statistica SAS Jakarta. He obtained his PhD Statistical Bioinformatics at Hassel University and later on work as a postdoctoral researcher at the Karolinska Institute, Stockholm. His current research interests include big data analytics and development for public policy, computational statistics, machine learning and artificial intelligence, and statistical software development. And our second speaker, Marlene Weiner, from the Statistic Austria, is known as the author of the 2019 YSP award paper called Be a Detective for a Day, How to Detect Falsified Interviews with Methods of Statistics. She has a master degree in statistics and mathematics and economics from the Technical University of Vienna and a master's degree in teacher training for physical education and mathematics from the University of Vienna and the Technical University of Vienna. Her final thesis was awarded in the category of Applied Statistics from the Austrian Society of Statistics. So 
Satya will speak first and then followed by Marlene. Your time to present is 20 minutes each and then we will uh, later on followed by discussion. Satya will talk about beyond the COVID-19, the official statistics way forward, and Marlene will talk about estimating the unknown the, the unknown number of COVID-19 cases in Austria. Sound interesting, right? So please, Satya, the time is yours. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Let me check. Yes, clearly. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vika, for the time. And good afternoon, everyone. And good morning, Hui Morgan, in uh, Holland and also good morning in Austria. So it's a great pleasure to be in this webinar. Uh, we observe a lot of observation, uh, participants here, more than 500, it could be on in other world. And we have already uh, uh, our uh, not speaker, Paso Harianta, which actually represent the needs of office as statistic for uh, COVID-19 handling. So my talk actually will be more on the uh, how the uh, official statistic after COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Yeah. So uh, as mentioned before that almost 3.8 million people have been confirmed to have a COVID-19 around the world. And this already uh, almost 150 countries have confirmed to have the case of COVID-19. And Indonesia, we have also starting from the mid, or I think in the beginning of March, right? So these uh, numbers, uh, so based on that, we can have a different 19 handling. If you look at the data from Indonesia, go to the next play, uh, slide, please. Next, yeah. yeah we have 12,000 uh, confirmed cases, and then uh, it's around uh, almost 1,000 have been died because of this uh, COVID-19. And then the numbers, of cases, almost all province, and then almost all the province have the confirmed cases. So the numbers that we observe here actually is uh, official data obtained from uh, different uh, stakeholders, and DPS are involved, as mentioned before, by our keynote speaker. And this uh, uh, information is needed for the uh, government policymaker to have good policy and also to see, to observe the impact of COVID-19 in all Indonesia. Let's go for the next uh, slide, please. Yeah, yeah. So this is the, the spread of uh, COVID-19 all Indonesia. Actually, the data, I took it uh, two days ago. So if we distribute that across all the regencies in Indonesia, Almost all, almost all regencies have the cases, ranging from zero to the highest hand at 100, 100 cases. And the epicenter of uh, cases are in Jab uh, Metropolitan, Jakarta Metropolitan or Jabodetabek, which is actually the red dot over there and the Java Island. And then uh, the, it's surrounding uh, cities, it's surrounding uh, province like Bantan and also West Java also have, have high, really high cases. This showing that the, we need to take serious the COVID-19 and the impact will be immense. I think uh, Pa Suharanto already mentioned the impact on economics and um, uh, how people are behavior how the impact on the different uh, uh, sectors, right? And let's let's go to the next slide. Let's uh, take a look for different perspective of different, uh, so this is the changes of mobility. I took the data from Google Mobility because of COVID-19, Google uh, 
provide data of uh, mobility in different uh, working space based on uh, tracing their uh, our mobile. So the changes in mobility, the y axis are the province and the x axis are dates. And the dots here represent the baseline from the percentage from baseline, the normal so Bali and the top one, showing that the Bali have big impact on mobility. Because uh, in the beginning of, I think already mentioned by uh, before that, the, the number of flight reduced and also the number of uh, tourists from abroad, especially China, which is actually the second largest uh, tourist, uh, is already uh, slower, lower. So the Bali have impact on working space here. Jakarta, the second one, showing uh, from the mid of March because of the policy of working from home, right? Uh, working from home started on the 17th or 16th of March, and after that, people tend to work from home. So it reduced the numbers. If you, the lighter the, the color means that the, the lighter the, the change from baseline, the smaller change from baseline. So it's minus 60 to 70 percent of the previous uh, months. But not the case from, uh, for example, North Maluku and also Riau uh, Island and also Central Kalimantan. They tend to have still some, some working uh, people working on the mid of March until mid of April. Let's go for the, if this is mobility on working space, uh, working places, how about in the next, please? Next, yeah, residential areas. So this number is showing different, uh, yeah, you know, from working areas, you no know, people moving to residential area, even though they are staying at home, right? But they still work, uh, like they still um, doing mobility, like maybe doing some uh, uh, sport or doing some small uh, uh, activities around the residential area. It's quite different when we don't have any uh, policy of uh, working from home. In, in March, less people are in the residential area, especially during the day. But then during April and May, we observe especially Jakarta, Bali, Banten, the epicenter of uh, Jakarta, Bali, and actually uh, Jakarta, Banten, and West Java, the epicenter of uh, COVID-19 cases, epidemics. We see that people tend to stay at home and then uh, not the case again for other uh, areas where the COVID-19 come from cases is low for such as Aceh or Central Kalimantan. Next. Next, please. Yeah. Again, uh, in retail and recreation areas, it's usually we go for uh, we tend to go for uh, recreation during the day or during the weekend, and we go for retail, we're going for mall, we're going for shopping areas. But now, after the mid of March, that quite big change, right? So this in the left side here is dark, uh, uh, dark colors, showing that in the beginning of March or in, in month of March, people are still going for retail and recreation area. But after the, the confirmed cases getting higher and higher, especially Jakarta here. These areas, especially Jakarta, the recreation areas are closed during uh, the, uh, lo let's say, semi-lockdown. And retail also closed in some uh, regions. So showing that how the changes in mobility of the people. Next. Next, please. Yeah. People tend to stay at home again, right? So they got bored easily, right? So uh, because they got they got bored easily, and then they try to get uh, let's say uh, to get access to internet. So it uh, the COVID nineteen have big impact on the data usage. So from open signal here, showing that uh, before uh, pandemic. 
people use their mobile uh, access or mobile uh, the phone mobile phone not using wi-fi because people are outside the building outside the houses but then because of a pandemic because of some countries uh, perform lockdown indonesia is only limited let's let's say restriction uh, areas or the restriction activities it's also improve or increase the the usage on using the wi-fi if you look at the the first uh, table there the in the beginning of January, it's only 34%, and then getting increased and increase up to 35%. Right now, I don't have any numbers, but I'm sure that number will increase. But that's quite different when uh, related to mobile uh, speed, the mobile um, number, uh, the mobile speed, or the mobile uh, uh, speed of the internet. Because of many people now using mobile phone for different activities for working from home, for learning from home. So the speed decreased quite significantly in some areas. I just give like a few countries here, but if you look at Indonesia, usually the speed is 11.7 megabyte per second, but in the begin, at the end of March, 23rd of March until 29th of March is getting lower, up to only 10, uh, uh, 10 megabyte per second. It's showing the number of people uh, like they just like uh, using a mobile phone more often and also more frequent as uh, compared as before. Next, please. Next is the impact of mobile traffic. Uh, I got the data from uh, indotelco.com showing how the increase of mobile traffic on different uh, applications. Telkom site and Excel, for example, on the on the, on the 24th of March and 23rd of March, the traffic of Google Classroom is quite, increased quite significantly, up to 2,000 percent as compared to the normal days. Because now, even the Polytechnic Statistic we use Google Classroom. I guess also in different universities also using Google Classroom as their online uh, learning uh, platform. This shows uh, again that uh, the remote work also quite high significance, online learning significance, and also related to the uh, entertainment. If you look at on the right side of the table, uh, Netflix 45% increase as compared to the pre uh, normal uh, uh, period, and also followed by video streaming. People get bored, they stay at home, they get bored, they watch movie. They watch uh, Netflix, they you, you watch YouTube, right? And then they play a uh, WhatsApp and then they, 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 the big impact is actually gaming. It's 117% uh, increase as compared to the uh, uh, normal day. This also actually we need to find, uh, usually I, I remember there's a report that the, the increase of uh, span on gaming is quite significantly right now in during this uh, COVID uh, period. Next. Now, if you look at, uh, please, next, please. I just give some impact. Uh, okay. I have uh, Pak Suharyanto mentioned before, so I add this uh, just uh, now that uh, based on the big data, we get the data from a website right from website that uh, showing the numbers of uh, jobs yeah, jobs uh, vacancy so the trend of job vacancies during a march and april is lower 45% this is because of this covid-19 again next please yeah so the numbers of uh, this showing the numbers of uh, companies that that advertising the uh, 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 the jobs right it also uh, reduced significantly on forty six percent reduced as compared to March and February it shows the numbers the impact is quite big in this uh, April. Next. 
yeah, impact on flight. So I got, we take the flight uh, based on again when, from big data, we get the data of flight uh, uh, daily from uh, different uh, airports in Indonesia. And then the departure and arrival, every day we use the, like say, uh, a robot to get the data and then get the data. And we see that the numbers of flights from, uh, this is domestic flight from and then to Jakarta reduce or decline significantly in the beginning, uh, in the mid of March and April, in the beginning of April. And actually until uh, we have uh, really limitations, they tend to have zero of flight because of the uh, uh, restriction by the government. But I think starting from yesterday, Today or from today. Next. Yeah, next please. Yeah. This is a room occupancy. Tikat penghunian kamar. So daily room occupancy in uh, 2019 as compared to 2020. The, the first month, uh, the first uh, January as, uh, and also up to the February and March is getting lower and lower as compared to uh, 2019. I don't give the, the, the figures here, but the, the, the highest impact actually, uh, Bali have the highest impact because of some, usually uh, last year we observe based on, uh, this is online travel agent. We are usually observe 70% uh, up to 80% of occupancy based on that uh, website. But during this uh, COVID-19, it's ranging between uh, 30 to 50 percent uh, occupancy. Even, and also in some uh, uh, found that some uh, less lack of uh, tourists. That's, uh, uh, we can that uh, we check the, to the people in the Bali, they said that's true because some people, some hotel have been closed due to the like, the number of tourism is very slow, very low. Next. Next, please. Yeah. Now, what, is, what will be the impact of statistical data collections, right? Actually, uh, Budia have mentioned before during the opening remarks, thank you for the opening remarks and also for nice introductions about me, uh, that some uh, survey, not some, maybe most of the survey and census has been, have a great impact because of the restrictions, especially the survey, that face-to-face -face survey, right? But if the survey using uh, uh, some phone survey, maybe still can be done. But the survey and the census usually done by face-to-face -face have the masking impact to be shut down. So they'll be like interrupted or will be postponed. So the response of this, some could be redesigned. So instead of using a face-to-face, -face, we use a phone survey. So we can ask them to fill in by using the web uh, uh, form. And for the census, we uh, postpone it and also redesign. BPS, uh, we have the census, uh, proportion census 2020. This year, we actually implement the combined methods, right? And then because of this COVID-19, uh, so because of, again, the COVID-19 have impact on the economy, economy have impact on the budget, right? So because of the cut budget, will also, imp will also impact the different aspect of statistical uh, process, including statistical data collections. So we must, uh, again, uh, change not using the face-to-face -face, uh, census, but rather using the online uh, census and also maybe using different uh, means, using drop-off method and etc. But and now, for in terms of the big data, actually, uh, 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 our keynote speaker had mentioned that the big data right now having the increase of relevance because uh, uh, now we can use uh, different uh, sources of big data in to, let's say, to not to, uh, com uh, not to replace, but to complement the, the uh, official statistic before. 
So now for this uh, uh, big data, we need to harness and integrate that to uh, the conventional survey or census uh, activities. Next, please. Yeah. Actually, not only Indonesia performed uh, census in 2020, a lot of countries performed 2000 and, uh, uh, census in 2020 and got impacted by COVID-19. Some countries, they, uh, they use uh, administrative data, so they will be fine, that much uh, impacted. Some countries, they, they uh, only use or let's like, focus only uh, on a face-to-face -face, uh, census. They, they tend to postpone it at the end of this year or next year. And some countries, they redesign the census into combined method or into online method as Indonesia does. This you can, uh, if you, you can see a uh, letter, the list of uh, different strategies of different countries of uh, census in 2020 because the impact of COVID-19. You can uh, see on the UN statistic division website letter. Next please. So after all the COVID-19, I'm pretty sure, or as a lot of uh, researchers, a lot of experts will say that, saying that we'll come into a new normal uh, period. We are not going to back to the, the normal that we have before. The new normal here, people tend to stay at home, right? right? They tend to do everything online. And then we still keep our physical distancing at least until next year. And then we try to have also uh, about the finance. We try to find different way of getting finance because some uh, financial uh, sector will get impacted. Then, and then that is, that's not going to be resolved easily or soon. So this new normal tend to, is also kind of a new challenge for official statistics to, to get the new uh, or better st uh, statistics. Next. So I'm not saying this is good for COVID-19, but there is a, a blessing in disguise. It means that because of COVID-19, citizen people are forced to, uh, to, get, to get ready or to involve in uh, the digital transformations, right? So we are accelerating the uh, digital uh, transformation. People usually they don't they, they they hesitate to use a phone to uh, to have a let's say uh, buying from uh, from shops or using a phone for uh, uh, for online learning or for for shopping. But now this digital transformation is getting faster, and then it will uh, force us to redesign the census and the survey because of the behavior of people are different right now. So we need to redesign the census and the way, maybe for example, by changing the different data collections. We're not focusing only now on the face-to-face -face data collections. In some, in some census, they should do that. Again, yes, that's true. But we try to find again, maybe in some uh, ways that we, we reduce the, to, to do a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, survey. And then we try to find different data sources. As mentioned by the, our keynote speaker, the data can, uh, could be one of the best data, uh, uh, alternative data sources, which can be uh, maybe uh, uh, used for uh, not only uh, complementing, but also maybe to improve the quality of official statistics. The big data can come from mobile phone records, credit cards, scanner data, remote sensing, etc. And again, the co-production of statistics, partic participatory data. I will, ex uh, I will explain that later about that co-production. Because, oh, sorry, sorry. Co-production means like this. The big data, go back, go back, please, go back, please, yeah. Big data, the data comes from different uh, stakeholders, from different uh, uh, producers. So we need to ask them to participate on the production of statistics, right? It could be from the uh, from uh, people, from crowdsourcing, for example, 
We can ask from the companies who own data. For example, in Indonesia, we have Gojek, we have uh, Agoda, we have Traveloka, or we have uh, also different marketplace or different e-commerce uh, platforms such as Tokopedia or Shopee and etc. We try to co-production with them. So we together with these uh, uh, stakeholders, with this uh, data uh, producer, to create a new uh, statistic based on uh, big data. Next. Next, yeah. So again, but big data have pro many pros and cons, contrasts, right? It faster, right, and more frequent for disseminations. And it also uh, can substantially reduce the non-response rates, right? And also maybe can reduce the cost of, of statistical productions. But next, please. But it also comes with some contrast. Yeah. This data is not a result of statistical production process designed in some standard practice, right? So usually we have standard practice for statistical production, but big data just get the data and try to find what is the best uh, right now. And then they, this big data do not fit with the current methodologies, classification and definition, but, and this can have a problem for like combining and harmonizing, harmonizing them, harmonizing, harmonizing them with the previous uh, statistic. If the previous one, we, the conventional, we have uh, different uh, methodologies, and now we have uh, different methodologies in big data. So we try to find a kind of a fit between these uh, approaches. And in, again, it raises a major uh, legal issues because of the security, confidentiality, and also the data ownership of the, of the big data. Yeah, next. So, and please read the book of Ryder Marker. It's a good book, just recently published, Official Statistics of 4.0. So, uh, he explained in his book that actually statistics also have some uh, uh, stages, right? Just like uh, industrial, industrial revolution, we have industrial revolution 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. But uh, the phase four, which actually started 2010, that including the statistic of using different uh, uh, data sources, like for example, open data, big data, data from uh, net social networks and uh, from machine to machine uh, communications. So I'm not sure that all st uh, national uh, offices right now have implemented here of official statistic 4.0, but I'm sure this will be for the next uh, way beyond after COVID, we need to adopt official statistics 4.0, especially for Indonesia and also, also for different uh, countries. Next. So what is the, uh, the key of, yeah, principle of official statistic 4.0? I just put this uh, uh, several key points. So the official statistic 4.0 means that we, the statistics actually should be the key for empowerment. So the statistician for us should explain, should provide uh, how the data can be a power for information, for business uh, case, for public policy. So the statistic is a key. So statistician or other uh, stakeholder, we should know this. And then the second uh, principle of uh, official statistic 4.0 is the fundamental uh, statistic for open data. Yeah. So the data should be open. Of course, not the data are open, but some uh, data can be open, not confidential data, and transparent access and about the, the metadata. And then we can monitor the use of information and the knowledge. The third one is the key uh, enabler of uh, citizen, which is data seek. So we have to promote, statisticians to promote the literacy of the data in the society, in the society uh, especially for uh, how we can, we can explain to them how the data are uh, obtained, are collected, and how the data are being analyzed, and the methodology being used, and then how the data can be used to monitor the 
uh, different aspect of development. And the third one is the future of smart statistics. This is a good thing that I really like a little bit. You have to have uh, smart statistics. So statistics here should continue to invest, not only use the previous one methods. We have a really like a lot of methods previously, all methods, but we need also because the new uh, data set, the new uh, sources, the new uh, stakeholders, we need to invest for the new methods, algorithms, business architectures, and also business process to, uh, so it can be tailored, it can be uh, customized using the user needs. The user needs might be different also in the future, not right this right now. And then the fourth one is the user participate on design, again here, production, communication of statistics. So we try to engage a greater involvement of civil society in the stage of statistical productions. We don't keep everything, the, the data and also the process right now in our own, but rather because we are participatory data and also uh, we have co-production again, I mentioned before, we need to involve also people from uh, stakeholder or different uh, uh, institution for uh, statistical productions. Next, please. So I don't, I don't know whether this time is up, but this is the co-production of statistics. I really love this, uh, this uh, uh, plot. It's again by Randall Marker. You should read this book. When you design a product and program, we need to we need to uh, we need participation in design. Participating means uh, the participation on terms of the data sources, yes, and also participating in terms of the design by the academicians, by the by, by the experts, right? Not only on or not only used by uh, the National Statistic Office, but again for production process, we uh, we use maybe open platform people can be used and also crowdsourcing, we because we. We need to uh, engage to the people, the community that, okay, see, we need your data so the data can be used for your own goods. So the people will, uh, they will give the data willingly, share the data willingly, and by making sure that their data, the confidentiality are kept, the security, and etc. And then we need to communicate the, the outputs, yeah, again, the outputs, uh, and also uh, by using different tools. We share the data, maybe we, they, we get the data directly. Uh, we can see the number of populations, their region by uh, applications. It has already done with the app statistic, where we can have the data directly in our hand with our gadgets. And also we can give the data for open. And then for uh, uh, decision making, we, we give the feedback to the, uh, to the uh, government and then we need also have a feedback from scientific support to to enhance the quality of the statistics so means that the and the if you, we if we talk the office statistic usually uh, is done only by uh, uh statistical uh offices yeah for example but for example bps or ons or cps in different uh, countries but rather now 4.0 34.0, again, that uh, being done by office statistic offices, but, but with incorporation with different stakeholders, with public, with, uh, with business, and also with other sectors. Next. Uh, Buika, I don't know whether it's, uh, it's time. No, I think this is last. Oh, this is last, okay. okay then. Yeah, the last, right. So at the last, we, I'm sure most of uh, the audience here are statisticians and working for National Statistics Office. We may, we must, I, I put like, uh, we must adopt the rapid trans transition in era digitization and the globalizations. But when we, uh, when we change, we know we, we, we should change, yeah. The change not only requires statistical methods, data science and IT, but also business administration and social, sociological knowledge. We have to know not only how to deal with the data, the IET and the statistical methods, but how to manage the data and how to interact, how to communicate, communicate with people and also with the stakeholder, with the government and also with like surrounding region. 
with uh, UN uh, with different countries. So the data or the statistic can be uh, disseminated uh, nicely. Uh, next, next. There's one more slide, I guess, or two more. So I just want to say that the COVID-19. This is the the website of Gugus Tugas or the Special Force of COVID-19 in Indonesia. You see that different stakeholders are now trying to handle this COVID-19, which means that never think that a national statistic or other stakeholder or other uh, ministries can work alone. We are we should work in a group and a team, right? But that's not the easy. I'm sure I know that and a team so the COVID-19 can reduce again and then after COVID-19 all the things that I mentioned before we need also support for this stakeholder I mentioned here okay next I think that's the last uh, the last uh, uh, slide so I'm, I'm sure that this is our uh, mascot of SP census penduduk uh, maybe in the next feature we Everything for us for going to the field, we need to wear mask or fit hazard pad or everything. Maybe we change the way we behave. The change we uh, also, uh, I said the 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 what's the the, uh, the tools, the appearance. I think that's all for me. Sorry for uh, maybe too much. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Satya. That's very interesting, very influencing, very convincing presentation. So, from your presentation, I can conclude that COVID-19 has a two-side impact on the, on the statistical activities. In one hand, it has impact in the increased demand for statistics to manage pandemic and also in its impact because we need data how the COVID-19 influence the people's daily life and also in the economy that you shown in your presentation. On the other hand, it also affects the official statistics that regularly conduct by the NSO in the survey and also in the census. So one of your example is in the 2020 Indonesian population census. Yes, the government of the Republic of Indonesia has restricted activities outside the home and also restricted face-to-face -face interaction. This condition, of course, impact the PBS activities. One of them is Population Census 2020. Coupled with government regulation regarding budgetary allocation for handling the COVID-19, that make BP, uh, Statistic Indonesia need to adjust the DC 2020's government in terms of the schedule and also in terms of the methods of activities at each stage of the process. Thank you very much, Satya. All right, then, without further ado, I will hand it over to Marlene for the next presentation. Please, Marlene, the time is yours. Yeah, hello, hello everyone. Um, thank you for attending in this great seminar. More than 500 people, that's amazing. Thank you for the previous speakers. I'm, I'm really impressed by your analysis. And thank you also, Easy Young Statisticians, for organizing this seminar. Yeah, good morning from Austria. It's 9.30 in Austria right now. Uh, what will I talk about today? I will talk about estimating the unknown number of COVID-19 cases in Austria. I'm Marlene Wernauer and I work in, the, in Statistics Austria, which is the National Statistical Office of Austria. So there is two studies I want to present today. So we have one study where we want to find out how many people are currently infected by COVID-19 in Austria. This is for whole Austria, so we want to make an estimate for the Austrian population how many people are really infected because the number of unknown cases is, yeah, there is a number of unknown cases. And for the second study, I want to share with you some results that uh, how many people live, uh, like how many people in Austria do have COVID-19 antibodies of people living in risk areas. Um, but before I come to the studies, I start with geography. So here we have Austria in the middle of Europe, next to Italy and next to Germany. Um, also some positive things in these hard times, what is 
Austria famous for. Um, we have the Wiener Schnitzel, very famous, maybe you know Austria for this, Sacher Torte, and also the movie Sound of Music. So to have an impression of how hard uh, Austria was hit by Corona crisis, I want to show you our official figures first. Um, the coronavirus started to uh, come to Austria at the end of February. So here we had our first case and then we had the exponential growth. Um, we could flatten the curve very early as we had very strict measurements from the government at already two weeks after the first case detected in Austria. So since March 16th, we already had very strict measurements and then the curve could be flattened soon. So the, the highest number of officially um, infected people in Austria was about 10,000 people. In comparison, we have 9 million people living in Austria. So I want to start with the first study now. So we wanted to know how many people are currently infected by COVID-19 in Austria. I will proceed in the following way. I will tell you why we did the study. So the study was ordered by the government. Then I will tell you how we did the study. Then I will come to the results. And finally, I will give some conclusions. So why we did the study. Um, it, in Austria, it's quite obvious that such a study is needed because crossing up just the number of positive cases divided by the number of tests conducted won't give us the real number of infected people. In, like many people are asymptotic and in Austria they won't receive a test if they are asymptotic. Also in Austria to receive a test you need to call a hotline and some people just don't do that. Um, even though they have symptoms we have a separate study on that. And even if you are symptomatic and even if you have called the hotline in Austria, it's not sure that you will receive a test then. Uh, because there are certain criteria to be met to receive a test. For example, you um, need to have met a corona positive person to really receive a test. Or also you need to have been in a risk area to receive a test. So I was interested to find out um, if this is the same also in other countries. So if you also think that the number of unknown cases is maybe much higher than the number um, of official figures. So I have created a Mentimeter. Please let me know if you, sh uh, if you can see it now in my, in my browser. Um, do you see still the, the presentation or do you see it uh, uh, in the browser a uh, Mentimeter right now? Can, can someone tell me if you see in the, if you still see the presentation or if you see um, a survey browsed in the internet? Still see your PDF. No, no, still see in the okay. presentation. Okay. I think still, you should... you're still in the presentation. Okay, yeah. then I, I will you share. Can... Then you can I share will... screen. Yeah, I will share it. Just take a second. So. So. Okay, obviously there are some problems to share the browsers, but then we just skip this part. Um, and I'll continue with the slides. So how did we conduct the studies? Um, we had three stratified, oh, so I need to share the present. So, so I will continue with the presentation as there were some problems in sharing the Mentimeter I created. So how did we conduct the study? We Mar had three Mar stratified- Marlene, can, can you please go, Marlene, can you please go uh, one slide? Go back. One slide? Uh, yeah, I would like to copy that uh, link, link of uh, Mentimeter. Yeah? 
yeah j- just wait wait one minute one minute okay uh, okay continue thank you okay um so please continue um, how we did uh, did we conduct the study? Our way was uh, very straightforward. So we just took three stratified representative random samples for Austria every three weeks to find out how many people are really infected. Of course, the best way would be to test everyone, but in Austria we don't have the resources for that. So the first panel where we tested a random sample of people was at the beginning of April. Then the next panel was very recently, so two weeks ago, we had the press conference uh, last uh, this week. And the, the next panel will be in one month, where we just test a stratified representative random sample for Austria for uh, we make PCR tests with them and test how many people are infected. Here are the participating organizations. So panel two and three is conducted by Statistics Austria. Panel one was conducted by Sora Institute and all panels are supported by the Austrian Red Cross and the Medical University of Austria. So what were our results? Take a look back at panel one. How was the situation there? So panel one was at the beginning of April. So already one month ago. What was the situation? We had the highest number of officially infected people in Austria by then. We had 10,000 officially infected people. Um, our governmental measurements were already very strict by then because um, since two weeks we had to shut down, so we weren't allowed to leave the house. Schools were closed, bars were closed, shops were closed. This was the situation two weeks before we took the random sample and um, asked and then tested a random sample of people to see how many of them were infected by COVID-19. So maybe take a second and try to guess or think for yourself and imagine how many people of our random sample, which is here on the right side, you would expect to be infected by COVID-19. Take a second, how many people you would expect to be infected and yeah it actually were only six people so it was quite a, a low number of infected people in our random uh, sample. Actually, how many people are currently infected by covid in australia hmm? estimating the unknown number of covid in australia yeah, I think we just skip the Mentimeter. Uh, not... if... Yeah, thank you very much. Um, then we had the, the second panel. Um, the situation in the second panel was already quite different because the official numbers went down far. So we only had about 3,000 officially tested people by then. And the governmental measurements were the same as before. So still we had very strict limitations of leaving the house and the same uh, measurements as before. But it was just three weeks later after the shutdown and we again took a random sample and tried to find out how many people were infected by coronavirus. So maybe you can also again try to imagine how many people of our random sample here will be infected of coronavirus. So this is the very recent study we had uh, published just last week. And also, it was only one person. So in the whole sample, only one person was infected by coronavirus that had not known uh, that uh, he was infected. Actually, when he was asked if he thinks that he would, uh, that he is infected by coronavirus, he said, no, he, he does not have coronavirus for sure. Um, but um, it was a difficult situation because it is a very small number of positive events. So we asked ourselves some question, like we wanted to know, is it possible to draw a good point estimator from this? And also we wanted to know um, which confidence interval is best fitting for like such a small number of positive cases. In this case, only one and in the panel before only six. 
And we then decided to report only the upper confidence intervals to give like an upper bound of people infected per maximum. Because we said if we only have one positive case, it's really hard to, to give a point estimator. It's very uncertain. And then the, the second question was, which confidence interval is best fitting for this case? And it's a bit of a mathematical playground, you can imagine, as there is a diversity of possible confidence intervals, all with their pros and cons. Um, there, were, there are some methods for confidence intervals to consider. For example, as you all know, the Klopper pearson interval, which is um, the exact interval for such a situation, but not really constructed for complex survey design. Then the bootstrap method also very good, but not really designed for such small proportions. And the, a, a few more like logistic regression with all type interval, Rouse Scott, we, we had the corn Groupon method, which I do like a lot as it is a combination of the Glopper Pearson interval for more complex survey design. Um, all of them are implemented in the R survey package. Um, However, I just wanted to point out it's not so easy to find the, the best confidence interval, but what we then decided is, as I already told you, to, to just give the, the maximum number of people infected to the press, so just the um, upper confidence interval. And we made a few scenarios there, and this is like one of the scenarios where you see that in panel two, so in the survey where actually only one person was infected, we can conclude that per maximum about 11,000 people were infected in Austria. And here in panel one, um, the, the gray one, it, that where six people were infected, that per maximum about 60,000 people were infected per maximum in Austria. So not as the point estimator, but per maximum. Here it is in the, in the news, and what I like about this graph it is that it combines both graphs you've seen before. So it combines the official figures um, with our estimated upper bounds for people um, infected per maximum with COVID-19. And you see then when the official figures were the highest, also the maximum number of probable infected people was way higher than then when the curve already decreased and the official figures went, went down also the, the maximum number of probably in of, um, more infected people also went down. So what can we conclude from this? Um, currently a small number of people is infected by coronavirus in Austria and but still the number of unknown cases can be much higher than official data and what we will consider for the, the next time is that we have to consider a scenario of, of zero events so i've never thought about this before but it's actually quite interesting that if you have uh, a zero positive cases of course in a survey of course your um, confidence interval is not zero zero but there are scenarios and we have to consider that for the case that we may have zero events in the next case. But for panel three, um, it could happen that the situation already is different by then and that we have more cases again as um, the governmental measurements have changed uh, since May. And since May in Austria, we have no limitations of leaving the house and the schools open again and the shops and bars open again. So uh, we are really curious to see how the situation will develop with this changing measurements of the government. Okay, then for the second study, which I will make a bit shorter as the time has already proceeded, um, we wanted to know how many people living in risk areas to have COVID-19 antibodies. So again, I will proceed in the same way. I will talk about why are we doing this? How, how are we doing this? What are the results and what are the conclusions? I think the why to find out how many people do have um, antibody is quite obvious. So we wanted to know how far are we from the herd immunity in Austria. If we can have something like herd immunity, which is not clear at the moment because we don't know if we can get 
immune of COVID-19. Um, what did we do or how did we do it? We took a random sample of people, but this time this random sample is not representative for whole Austria. It's only representative for risk regions. And this is what also other international studies do. They test people in risk regions to see how many people of them living in risk regions do have corona antibody because we would expect a, a higher share there of people developing corona antibody. So it is important to note that these results are not representative for all Austria. Um, we again took the random sample, but only for the risk regions, and made PCR tests with everyone in our sample and also antibody quick tests as well as blood samples for the serological test. And they were also checked with a neutralization test. So um, according to Medical University, with these tests, we um, do not have to expect false positives. So we won't overestimate the number at least. Um, there would be the next Mentimeter, but I just skip it. What are our results of the study? We found out that in the 27 risk communes, in average, about 5% of the people have corona antibodies with a certain confidence interval. And this is according to the blood samples of serological tests. And what can we conclude from this? Like, 5% of people living in risk areas having corona antibody is not really a high number. We, we would have expected a much higher number of, because in Austria there were some really um, hard um, risk areas where really, really many people had coronavirus. So we would, expect, would have expected more people in these areas to also develop corona antibody there. Um, but our figures seem to be similar to other figures shown in international studies. For example, there was a very famous study in Germany. It was for Gangelt in North Rhine-Westfalen, and there 14% of the people developed corona antibody. The study was somehow, crit somehow criticized for sample and form of the test. Then also in St uh, Stockholm, there was a, a study with blood donators and there, 11% of the people developed corona antibody. In the south of Netherlands, there was a similar study with blood donators, and 3% of the people there developed corona antibodies. Um, also in California, there was a study, um, two studies actually, um, and they were also a bit disputed, and after some recalculations, they came to the findings that 2.5 to 4% of all people in certain areas in California to have corona antibody. Very good study I found was a New York City study. They found 19% of the people there having corona antibody. And in comparison, but New York City also has very high prevalence of coronavirus, but in comparison in the rural areas of New York City, only 3% of the people seem to have corona antibody. So, so how to conclude, if it is possible for us to get immunity in Austria, we are far, far away from herd immunity at the moment. And the international studies show that it is also this case in other countries. And, but Austria has never really targeted to get herd immunity. What can we conclude? Like herd immunity, as we, most of us already, have find, found out seems to be an illusion and we really need to focus on the development of medication and recognizes. Yeah, this, here I have some question, questions to the audience, like I would be interested which studies like these do you have in your, in your countries, what experiences do you have and what other approaches do you have, like do you have some big data approaches or simulations or estimations through death counts to find out how many people are currently infected in your country, um, including unknown figures. Yeah, I think my time is already up. I want to thank everyone involved in the studies. So the Red Cross Austria, 
Medical University of Vienna, Sorla Institute and Statistics Austria. I want to thank Easy Young Statisticians for this great webinar and also I want to thank you all for your attention. Here is my email address, so if you have any questions, you can just write me. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Marlene. That's very interesting presentation. So everyone, right now we are going to move for, uh, to the discussion session, the session that you are waiting for, I believe. So uh, there are a couple of questions for Mr. Saharianto. Will that be okay, sir? Yes, okay. Okay, thank you, sir. So the first question is from Igede Heprin Prayasta, graduate students in economics for the Vienna University. Indonesia economy currently is reported growth by 2.97% YOY during the first quarter of this year. And one of the largest contributors is the financial and services industries. Would you mind to explain how the industry boosts the economy as currently people may have no money, no job, or maybe working not in the normal scheme as previously? Does the pandemic stimulate them to take the loan for consumption needs? And this is also related to the second question from Adi Pradana from Indonesia as well. How long Indonesia economy can recover from this pandemic? I think that's two questions for the first time, sir. And for the, the second is for, the third question is for Satya Pramana from Putri Finansela, Indonesia, from the Statistic Indonesia. How does big data can affect COVID-19 treatment or the spread of the virus or even protecting the people effectively? Using the big data, can we predict about the time when will this pandemic end in Indonesia especially? Then every aspect such as economy, tourism, education, etc. can run normally just like before the virus spread. And the second question for the for Satya is from Ayu Paramudita, also from the Statistics Indonesia. It is very interesting how we can use and analyze big data. But big data is kind of unstructured data and there is no certain concept and metadata, etc. So how we decide what kind of big data we could use to analyze and how far we could analyze it. Thank you. And question for Marlene. There is question from Ekundayo Adedoyin from Nigeria. The question is, from news across the globe, the coronavirus seems to have higher rate of spread, infection, and ultimately higher risk of death in some countries than another. Can these disparities be truly associated with genetic resilience or maybe racial differences? Also, what is the odd of death from contracting COVID-19 between male and female of some age group. And the second question is from Armando Aviles from Ecuador. What are the assumptions, constraints, and effectiveness on the models that you already mentioned before? So the first time maybe, Sir Soharyanto, please, sir. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the question. I will see the structure of the Indonesian economic. Uh, Indonesian economic rely on, on the four biggest sector, industry, which con uh, contribute 14%, agriculture, which contribute 13%, and then trade contribute 13%, construction 11%. So the total contribution from this four sector is around um, 57%. And the number of labor working in this four sector is around 68%. What does it mean? If something happened in the industry, agriculture, trade, and construction, it can affect 
very much to the economic growth of Indonesia. For your note, that the uh, financial uh, insurance and services contribute uh, 4.70%. So the question is, uh, how will this uh, sector, financial service, perform when everybody at the moment experience in the decreased income? Is it possible for them to increase their loan in order to fill their consumption? Uh, for the quarter uh, 1 2020, I have to mention that the performance of financial uh, services and insurance achieved the highest uh, performance because it grows 10.7%. Uh, this is quite, 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 uh, quite high, the highest, in fact, in this quarter. Uh, maybe in this situation, people will not increase their loan for the consumption. The latest data show that they switch from the consumption of non-food to food. This is what happened at the moment. So because the income is decreased, they're switching the consumption from non-food to food because this is the basic. If the consumption of non-food affect, for example, to buying clothes, etc., it's okay but it will be very, very crucial if they also decrease the expenditure for, for example, education and health. So I think the loan will not increase. Uh, at the moment, the people still try to switch from non-food uh, to food, but I don't know what will happen later. The second question, when will economic growth in Indonesia recover? The answer, Nobody knows. It really depends how the government successfully combat the epidemic. In the second quarter, all of the indicators show that the indicator is worse for the manufacturing and other other sector because the number of uh, the number of uh, people who lost the job is increased, but the government actually already prepared the plan to recover economy in the third quarter. But how far it will be successful? Again, it really depends what happened in the quarter two. Maybe that's um, uh, what can I answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So next, move to Satya. Can Hello, you hear me? Satya? Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So I saw that. Thank you for uh, the questions. So there are two questions. I guess one is how the data involve uh, the uh, affect data can affect treatment spread of even protecting people from effective. Okay, good. So actually, right now. I guess some of the participants here also involved in big data uh, implementation for different aspects of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, treatments. There are groups uh, by, for example, different universities, they use data from different sources, especially data of uh, clinical data, sequencing data. I used to work with the uh, gene sequencing data and also uh, clinical data and also for using the uh, thorax MRI data or scan data uh, uh, Rongson data everything data to to find the diagnostic tool to to see whether we have a diagnostic tool for uh, COVID-19 because the mutations so we talk about virus virus actually have really higher mutation rates so it mutate because we need to adopt to its uh, host. So from one person to another person, if you know the DNA of the virus, so we can know the transmission network, that being also used for uh, research right now. Why it's big, you know, sequencing in virus is also big, and also you have different uh, samples, it's also quite big, and compare and also combine with different sources. 
And related to the, the next is how uh, the big data can be used for protecting and people effectively, right? And predict the time. So for protecting the people effectively, uh, Google's Google's or, or the special tools have special task force have uh, used or uh, have uh, developed uh, integrated data collections, which actually from data from uh, the BPS, data from uh, Ministry of Health, data from BNPB, data from different stakeholders combined into one locations in one system, and that's uh, being uh, run and developed by uh, Ministry of Communications, and then being analyzed to find the uh, the effective way to protecting. So uh, there are some uh, system being uh, developed and uh, launched right now and being used. At to track people based on using mo uh, mo their mobile phone. So if you have the implement, have you uh, installed uh, Peduli Lindungi or Bersatu Lawan COVID applications that actually be used to track people, the movement. So we can see based on this data, we can see which area that actually have high risk of uh, the specific uh, location. And so we combine with data from BPS, from official statistics related, for example, the number of uh, people over there, the the number of uh, comorbidity over there, the number of uh, female of males uh, population over there. That's combined to so we can have the risk, and also combined with uh, for data of here um, location of people who tend to to gather. For example, the uh, religion uh, religious uh, uh, locations for example mosques or or churches stations market that that's being used to use to make a, a like kind of mapping so the area uh, of whether it's red area or uh, green zone so if you move one place another place so we'll be warned by the system so you are in going to the the red zone or the the, the dangerous area that's being used for uh, big data right now on the big Google's Tugas. And using big data can predict about the time, wow, pandemic, especially. Uh, uh, it's, I'm not sure we can predict easily right now because first, related to COVID, in the beginning of COVID in Indonesia, the, the numbers actually not representing, it's my opinion, yeah? it's not representing exactly the number of confirmed uh, uh, positive cases. Whether it's, co uh, it's uh, representing the, the capacity of testing, because in the beginning we just have limited uh, numbers of uh, testing uh, kits. But now because the testing is being uh, in, in all provinces, so the, the number is getting growing, uh, the number of confirmed cases, but also uh, we know that the, the the value, the numbers, it's uh, is getting higher. So, using the mathematical modeling, there are several mathematical modeling based on this data is being used right now. So, actually, there are plenty of uh, like uh, approaches to predict it, but some prediction also have some limitation or some assumptions. So, right now, the use of uh, big data as far as I know, is to, to track people, to make, to, to, to make sure that people are in the, in, at home. And then this uh, information can be used for uh, government to make a policy based on situation on, on the field. Kemudian, second one, it's very interesting how we can use big data and analyze big data. But okay, unstructured exactly, and unstructured and uh, no metadata exactly. So the concept, that's, that's true. That's why the pro, uh, the cons and also difficulties of big data for using the, uh, for uh, official statistics. Because um, the uh, definition and also the concept and definition is quite loosely. So sometimes it's difficult to, to, to match that, but not, uh, is, uh, it doesn't mean it's not possible. So we have to find the right, uh, let's say, com uh, definition of this uh, big data and also the conventional approach. And then uh, how far we could analyze it. So right now we can analyze it up to give the, the general trend only, right? But not yet for having like exact numbers yet. 
because again, as I mentioned, the representativeness, the big questions. That's uh, that's actually the next come to the next challenge. I know there are some uh, researchers right now, including in BPS, you know, including in uh, our neighboring countries, working on how to combine the information of big data using and also with the conventional or uh, un, un, uh, structured uh, data. So we, when we combine them, it could be one way we can include the uh, non-respondent using the big data. Also, maybe we can use like uh, big data as uh, midterm uh, information because usually we have survey between several uh, period, right? In between, we can we can have the information based on big data right now. Yeah, I think that's uh, my uh, answers. Is there any is there being answers? Uh, I think because the time is very limited, maybe yeah. we can move to the next presenter. Okay, okay. Cynthia, thank you very much. Okay, okay Marlon, uh, the time is yours. I, I try to answer within, uh, very, very fast because the time is limited. So I hope I answer all questions and the right questions. Um, the first one was um, if there can be disparities between different countries truly associated with genetic resilience, racial differences, well, I, I can't tell from this study. Um, I, I don't know why it developed differently in different countries. We were lucky that we had very early measurements, but we are also a neighboring country of Italy and so how, how cruel the situation was there and they were two weeks headed before Austria. Then there was the question, what is the odd of death from co contract COVID-19 between, uh, between male and female um, and of same age group? A uh, very interesting question. Actually, there is a study in Statistics Austria for this right now, but it will be presented uh, next week in press conference, but I can share the link then on the Facebook page. Then there was a question how the sample was drawn. The sample was drawn um, as follows, so the population was divided in two parts, like in people living in cities and then also people living in area, uh, rural areas. These were our two parts the population was divided in. And then we had a two-stage sample design, original sample design, and we a bit um, oversampled people um, with lower education as this study was not um, you didn't have to do the study, so and we thought that we get a higher response rate here. Then finally, there was the questions for the model used. Um, um, yeah, as I told you, we had the sample. We had we had a sample survey and just had a, a low number of cases with positive events. We now used just the bootstrap confidence interval, as which I've shown you here. So there is no assumptions to that, but uh, we also made other scenarios with um, the, the Gropper Pearson um, interval and uh, adaption for the Gropper Pearson interval. We have um, summarized this in a report and maybe as the time is short, it's also easier if I share the figures of the reports with you on the Facebook page or share. Uh, so we we used what I presented to you was the the bootstrap confidence interval, um, the, the upper limit of the bootstrap confidence interval, and the what we also think that the adapted version of the Glopper Pearson is very appropriate to compute upper confidence limits for this. The figures are always a bit different, but what we can see that the low number, however. If you use that method or that method, that the number is really no a low of people unknown infected in Austria. And then finally, there was the question for the um, effective sample size. I can share uh, the effect, I can share the screen. There, it's German. So sorry for that. Um, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay, I don't, okay, I, I have some problems in sharing, but the effective sample size was, where do I see it, mm -hmm. 2,300 people and the signed effect was 1.3.
yeah, I hope the questions are answered. Is that all, Marlene? Or do you want to add something? Uh, do, do you want to hear some more? I, I It would be all yeah, for now. Like if you have some information to share. No, I think for now this is all. But if you want to, uh, if there are some other questions, just ask me. Okay, maybe you can put in the link later on, okay? Yeah. For the materials. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much. So everyone, I'm afraid that those questions will be uh, the one and only session of discussion today. I'm really sorry that we are not be able to answer all of your question. It doesn't mean that your question is not important or maybe irrelevant. It's merely because the discussion time is very limited. All of you have been doing great and really appreciate your enthusiasm. For those whose question has not been answered yet, please send your question to the presenter email that's shown on the screen, you can see, right? And all materials today could be accessed through the link shown below the presenter email. So to be concluded, we can say that the role of statistics cannot be underestimated. If I can borrow the statement of Mr. Suharyanto, Statistic is the trust of the subject. Therefore, no statistics, there will be no information, and of course, there is no intervention. I do want to thank once again to Mr. Suharyanto, Olivia van Dijk Timbal, and Mara Sherlin again for staying during the whole session of today's webinar, and also Satya Pramana and Marlene Weiner for the great presentation. I believe that everyone have a great knowledge today. It's very enhancing our knowledge. It's very enjoyable presentation and discussion today. And also, last but not least, I want to thank all of the participants for being very active during the discussion session. I wish everyone staying healthy, happy, safe, and also sane in this pandemic situation. Good afternoon. I will hand it over again to the MC, please, Mega. Thank you, dear. Now moving on to our last agenda, please welcome the SB community, re community representative for the closing remarks, Ahmad Rizal, the time is yours. Hello, everyone. I'm Rizal, the chairman of webinar from SB committee. First of all, I would like to thank the Master of Time for giving me the great honor to deliver this closing remarks speech. On behalf of the YISI and SB committee, I welcome, to, I welcome you all and thank you very much for more than 1.5 thousand people from 26 countries over the world for joining this webinar. This webinar was main theme COVID-19 from a statistical point of view is carried out because of collaboration between YSISI and SB committee community in Indonesia. I hope that every, every participant here has a mutual understanding of the role of statistics in handling COVID-19 and will help your country a lot. I would like to say thank you too to our great keynote speaker Suharyanto, Chief of Statistics Indonesia, Olivia van Dijk Timbal from ISI representative, Mara Serlin from YSISI representative and presenters Satya Pramana and Merlin for the new insight about statistics and COVID-19. It's, it's such our precious experience to get great knowledge from you all. For additional information, we are from SB Community, also open a donation to help struggling people in COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. Everyone can participate on it with open the link s.bps.go.id slash donasi underscore SB. Now the fund collected have reached more than one ten thousand million ten million rupees, and the donation will open until seven days to go. Last but not the least, I will I would like to close my remarks. Thank you for your attending and participation, especially to YSASI for a great collaboration. Wishing it, it wishing it is not the last. Hope this webinar gives a lot of benefit for all over the participants, and I hope all of us are keeping well. Thank you. Thank you, Rizal, for the closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I'd like to remind you all that SB Community is organizing a fundraising project to help those who are struggling with the COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. 
please visit s.bps.go.id slash donasi underscore sp to donate. You can also contact us on our social media account listed below. Well, that wraps up our event for today. Thank you for all the, for all the participants that are joining us today. Stay safe and good afternoon. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for Masana. your participation. Thank you, Thank everyone. You, so much, sir. Thank you too, sir. <laughs> Have a Bye. nice weekend, everyone. Thank you. Too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Pasatia. Thank you. Thank you to my old Greetings from Ecuador. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Hi.